Hi there, me, your friendly neighborhood humble stroke assaulter. So I'm going to do a response video to someone who made a comment on my video about toxic positivity. So we're going to discuss toxic spirituality. I've done a bit of research on this. Some of the research has been um, watching hours of some of these self-help gurus, specifically Eckhart Tolle, um, as the person left the comment made specific reference to that individual, but we're going to discuss religion, spirituality, and how that can be toxic in relationships, how enforcing your worldview on somebody else and the relationship you have with that other person is toxic, and we'll discuss that. And I'm joined by my co-host, come here buddy, Crash the Wonderbird, right there, that's Crash. There you go bud. So, Spirituality and, and religion don't necessarily have to be the same thing. Uh, you can be a spiritual individual and religious. You can be religious without being spiritual, and you can be spiritual without being religious. It all depends on what those terms mean to you. How do those terms relate to you? How do those terms relate to each other and your worldview? So, and we'll get into some of that. So, basically... It, it can be difficult dealing with someone that is very religious um, because if you don't share the exact same fundamental core beliefs in how they practice their religion in an equal manner and how you practice your religion, even though you may, and I'll just use Christianity as an example, um, even though you may be of the same core belief system, you may not practice your belief the same way. For example, if you believe that you should be handling dangerous, venomous serpents during church, and I don't, well, you and I don't have the same set of religious practices. If you believe that you should never get a blood transfusion, and I don't believe that, we now have fundamental differences on how we practice our religion. So... Just in, in between one of the 300,000 versions of Christianity that there is there, between, you know, you get your, your Roman Catholics, your Greek Orthodox Catholics, uh, you get Lutherans, Presbyterians, Anglicans, whatever the case may be. Uh, and then what if you deal with two different religions that are strikingly similar? Judaism and Christianity. They come from the same books but they practice their faiths and the tenets of their faiths differently. And we're not going to get into the spiritually spiritually corrupt individuals like the NFIB. We're not going to discuss about them because I'm not going to get into that debate here. For those that don't know what that debate is, it concerns Dear Mr. Atheist and Tommy McMurtry. And I'm not saying Tommy McMurtry might be sexually attracted to pumpkins. I'm just saying we don't know. And that's where I'm going to leave that. For those of you that don't know what I'm talking about, that's okay. Go watch some of Dear Mr. Atheist. So religion and spirituality deals, in some cases, in an alienation between our emotions in our bodies, between our passions and our thinking, between what we have in the form of necessities in our life and then necessities for our faith. And those can be drastically different. So because you may be involved in either a set of spiritual beliefs or a set of religious beliefs, that can tend to distance you or distance others from you just because of the way you live your life, your core beliefs, um, how your journey looks like through the world. And it's difficult to trust people or interact with people when they refuse you your opportunity to be authentic, they refuse you your opportunity to be true, and they refuse you your opportunity to have a sense of agency uh, in and about yourself. So, after my stroke, I see a lot of people on the Facebooks, 
publishing things like, oh, God took care of me. You know, God was there for me. And we're going to use God in the, the generic sense. Well, I'm going to say, well, if God was there for you, if your God is an all-knowing, all-powerful being that has perfect knowledge and has a predetermined and preordained plan for everyone, God gave you your stroke. Yeah. The reason why you had a stroke was God. So, yeah, God was there for you because God gave you your stroke. Um, don't ever say God didn't do anything for you because God gave you brain damage. And then you get the people that like, oh, pray for me, pray for me. But why? God has a plan. You don't need to pray. You don't even need to attend therapies. So give up your physio, give up your speech and language, give up your occupational, give up your psychiatric help, stop taking your medications, stop doing your exercises, and just pray. Because if God truly loves you, he will take care of you. And if he doesn't, eh, he fucking hates you. It, it's pretty much a 50-50 split. So, and I've had people try to tell me that God was looking out for me. Okay, maybe God was, but my challenge is who's God? Which God? Um, Hermes, Mercury, Loki, any one of those three, they're kind of jokesters. Uh, what about Vishnu? Okay, was it Vishnu? Um, could it been, you know, any of the... Um, H.P. Lovecraft, like Cthulhu. Was Cthulhu really there? You know, whose God do you want to talk about? And that's another esoteric topic that we're not really getting in, into. But just once people start trying to enforce their religious worldview upon you, you now have to try not to sound like a dick. And I'm like, well, if I believed in your magical sky daddy, I would share the same worldview as you. But sadly, I don't believe in the same sky daddy philosophy so i'm having a difficult time putting that all together so religion for the purposes of our discussion is going to be an organized system of beliefs and practices rituals and symbols designed to facilitate closeness to the sacred or transcendent be it the god the higher power some universal truth right there's there's an actual codified method to facilitate your worship, where spirituality is the personal quest for understanding answers to the ultimate big life questions about the meaning of life and the relationships with people. And this may or may not involve sacred or transcend, trans, transcendental concept. Um, this may or may not involve religious beliefs. It may or may not involve the formation of a religious community, um, you know, this can be, spirituality can be done on an individual basis. Um, sure, there are spirituality workshops, and we'll discuss some of that in a minute. Um, there are books on spirituality. Uh, they may, may or may not be in the religion section of your local bookshop. They may be in the self-help section. They may be in the new age section. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, they should all be in the fiction section. And... These spirituality gurus, they come and go like the wind. And depending on who the social commentator is or the social influencer is of that time or that period will depend on how much traction the, that spirituality guru gets. Uh, the Rajneesis in, in the States in the latter 80s, early 90s, there is a good example. Spirituality movement that also turned into religion but turned into the largest bioterrorism attack in the history of the United States, with the exception of the anthrax event post 9 11. Um, you know, you end up with the Jim Joneses, where, you know, Jim Jones Kool Aid, now a new arsenic cherry flavor. Um, you know, unfortunately, Jim Jones was a spiritual, religious individual who moved um, his entire flock uh, down to Guyana and then murdered them. So just because someone is spiritual, just because someone is religious, doesn't necessarily mean they're a decent or good person. And then you get into the concept that religion and spirituality and psychiatry and mental health, they are going to be in conflict. So if you have a mental health issue or you have a chronic ongoing health issue, such as a brain injury, Unfortunately, the people that are involved in that spirituality community, in that religious community, 
depending on how they perceive mental health, depending on how they perceive chronic illness that has no cure, uh, will depend on how that relationship is pursued. So depending on the textbook you want to read about the history of psychiatry and the history of medicine, well, the Dark Ages, mental health was considered to be witchcraft. Mental health was considered to be demonology. Mental health was considered to be, you know, a matter of the church, a matter of religion. You needed an inquisitor, you know, you needed an exorcism. You didn't need a doctor. You didn't need medication. You may not have needed a surgery. You needed to be drowned or burned at the stake or whatever might be appropriate. So humankind, we have developed knowledge. And that knowledge changes over lengthy periods of understanding, lengthy periods of experimentation, lengthy periods of discovery. So as our knowledge has increased from the dark ages, we now understand mental health. We may not understand all of it. We may, not, we may understand enough of it to make lives more manageable in some cases. In other cases, we understand so much, we can take disorders such as I'm going to use schizophrenia that even 40 years ago was essentially a death sentence. 40 years ago, if you were diagnosed with schizophrenia, things weren't good in your world. You were probably going to be institutionalized for the rest of your natural life, um, or you'd end up homeless. Now, schizophrenia is not that case. Schizophrenia is a chronic health condition that is a chronic mental health condition, and with the appropriate treatment, intervention, support groups, and, and other strategies, people with schizophrenia can lead productive, healthy, normal lives. They just have to take their medication every day, kind of like a diabetic. And all religions have some text, some tome, some book to refer to, be that the Talmud, be that the Torah, the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Quran, other books that I'm not familiar with. All of these religious teachings provided a method, mechanism, and manner to live your life. It includes things about diet, things about food handling, things about public health, purity, circumcision, sexual behavior, how to wear your clothing, how not to wear your clothing. Like all of these books had canon law, religious law, things you had to do in order to be quote unquote faithful. And some of them were a matter of just common sense. Now we get into the spirituality movement, right? And I'm going to blame Oprah because it's easy and she, she's not here to defend herself. So the Oprah Winfrey book club, things like The Secret, Right? or Reiki, or Crystals, or um, Eckhart Tolle in his Power of Now. These, in my opinion, again, my opinion, these create a cult of vocabulary and a cult of emotional regulation. They don't want you to be authentic. They want to trap you in the use of language, where I'm going to use Eckhart Tolle, or Tolle as an example, um, and I don't want to say he kind of looks like if Yoda and Smeagol had a love child, but that's, every time I hear him talk, that's what I think. Um, the man takes 12 minutes to answer a question. He never directly answers a single question. Uh, he uses simple psychiatric, psychological concepts. He mixes those with a literally a salad bar of religions and spiritual beliefs from around the world, be they um, East Indian, be they Hindu, be they, um, you know, uh, some Scandinavian religions, be they Christianity. He appears to have taken various religious spiritual teachings, thrown it all into a blender, and just regurgitates. So, and he says things that just, in some cases, doesn't make sense. He likes to take simple psychological and spiritual concepts and terms and obscure these things with language that's difficult to maintain. He talks about unconscious people, and emotional people are unconscious people, and you need to be more present. At one point, he had a shift in his consciousness, 
uh, and that allowed him to become more present. Well, he also says that thinking is pain. I don't know what to think about all of that. I just know that if you're going to try to require me to engage you in a conversation at any time, and I'm required to use your spiritual benchmarks, your spiritual dogma, your spiritual necessities, just in order for you and I to have a conversation, you actually don't want to have a conversation with me. You want to point out why I'm deficient and then try to bring me into the brainwashed fold that you belong to. And how can how can you be in a effective and equal relationship where both people are at least in the terms of communication, are equals if one person demands that you use a style guide for your language, right? If you're in university, you're in college, you, you work as a journalist, uh, you're going to have a style guide on, on how your paper should be written and the words that should be spelt in a certain way. And we prefer sentences that start in a certain manner and we prefer a paragraph that is no more than 25 lines long. We prefer a sentence that is no more than 12 words long. In that situation, a style guide is, is effective. But when you're dealing with things that are messy, like interpersonal relationships and the communication between two people or more, to have an enforced style guide that I'm required to commit to every time I want to engage, engage you in a conversation regardless of what that conversation is about, you're not having an authentic relationship with that person. You're not having an authentic conversation with that person. You're again placating them. You are having to check your necessities, your needs, your wants, your desires at the door in order to even enter the room with them so you can start to have a conversation with them. The problem is Will that person now try to point out your deficiencies? Will that person now try to point out why you're thinking the wrong way? Will this person try to be almost Orwellian um, and use the new speak? That's not a relationship. That's, I don't know what to call that, but that's, that's not a relationship. So that's my thinking, that's my take on toxic spirituality, toxic religiosity, um, and how having enforced or required spirituality is just toxic to being authentic. And if you have any comments about the video, please leave them down below. Uh, again, this is a response video made to someone who left a comment on my channel. I'd like to thank everyone that's taken the time to subscribe. And if you happen to enjoy what you've been watching over the past almost 12 months, please like, share, subscribe. If you happen to know someone going through their own post-stroke post journey, please like, share, subscribe, point the channel out to them. If there's something you'd like to see me cover, you can reach to me on the Twitters, uh, Twitter handles in, in the description down below. You can email me at strokeassaulter at gmail.com, or you can just leave a comment here if you wish to. And if you happen to see someone that's going through what appears to be the signs or symptoms of a stroke, that being someone who uh, uh, appears to be befuddled, confused, uh, or has lost their sense of balance, someone who um, has vision problems, they can't see it in one eye. They see it a grayscale. They only see a little dot in the world. Someone has facial droop. There's a visual noticeable slacking of the facial muscles. Someone who can't raise both arms equally effectively or at all. Someone who has slurred, stuttering speech. Someone who has inappropriate word usage for situation or context. Someone who can't smile equally effectively or at all. Someone who can't stand unaided, right? Has general body weakness or weakness on one side. Please immediately place that person in a position of comfort and dial 911. Something so simple can save a life.